our goal is to motivate physical activity on a global scale. Our team will produce tools and knowledge that can be disseminated at a very low cost to improve the physical and mental health of millions of individuals. Life is movement. We're born to run and walk and play. Babies are driven to walk and we all take great pride in their first steps. Walking speed is a hallmark of independence and diminished walking speed is a sign of frailty. Indeed, walking speed has been proposed as a new vital sign along with blood pressure and temperature. Yet after six million years walking around the earth as hunter-gatherers, there is now, uh, we can mostly observe humans sitting in front of glowing screens on comfy chairs as we're doing here this morning. Indeed, there's a global pandemic of physical inactivity. The CDC reported that in the US alone, 260 million Americans are not sufficiently active to maintain their health. It's 80, 78% of the population. Min Lee and her colleagues recently reported that 5.3 million deaths each year are attributable to physical inactivity. 5.3 million deaths every year. Now it's possible to make a calculation like this because 18 major diseases and disorders are linked to physical inactivity. Diabetes type two, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, are all linked to physical inactivity. In addition, depression, anxiety, and dementia are also linked to physical inactivity. We recently conducted the world's largest survey of physical activity. We worked with a local company, Azumio, that has this wonderful health app, and they provided minute-by-minute -minute data on how much people were moving. When we analyzed the data, we discovered that activity is not distributed uniformly within a population. There's activity inequality, just like there's income inequality. So there's activity rich people and activity poor people. And when there's high activity inequality, it differentially disadvantages women. So there are more activity poor women where there's high activity inequality. And when that's the case, women suffer in terms of lost life years and increased disease. Now one of our team members, Abby King, is the co-chair of the committee that recommends physical activity guidelines in the US. And that committee just issued, a couple months ago, a fantastic report that provides a review of the scientific literature regarding physical activity. One thing that's clear from this report is that exercise is potent medicine. Let me just give you a couple quotes from their report. Okay, quote number one. A single bout of moderate to vigorous physical activity will reduce blood pressure, improve sleep, reduce anxiety, and improve cognition. So you can reduce your anxiety and improve your mental clarity by going out on your bike one time. Second quote, there's no threshold that must be exceeded before the benefits of exercise begin to occur. You don't need to run five miles a day. If you get up and move for five minutes, you begin to accrue the benefits of physical exercise. The report also provides strong evidence that physical activity is potent medicine that can reduce the pain of osteoarthritis, can reduce anxiety, and is a powerful antidepressant. There is no shortage of devices that will track your activity, yet most of these interventions are failing. So why is that? They provide lots of information, but very few people respond to information overload by moving more. You may get texts to encourage you to get up and move at inopportune times, and mostly these go ignored. Most activity trackers will be a nifty toy when you first get it, but end up in the drawer, so it's only short-term engagement. In part because they're one size fits all. They aren't personalized to your particular needs and motivational framework. Our approach is based on excellent scientific evidence that replaces information overload with mindset. For example, it's clear that 
in some instances, providing quantitative information can produce a mindset of inadequacy. If I don't move enough, I will get disease X, for example. We are replacing bothersome texts with well-validated behavior change theory. And I'll give you a specific example of how this can come into play and work. Instead of short-term engagement, we're using stories, to, narratives, that can engage people over the long term and data-driven personalization. So we know what works on you and what doesn't work, and you'll stop getting messages about things that are not gonna work. Our team's interdisciplinary. We've had a great time getting together and learning from each other. It's so exciting. I came out of a meeting uh, where we were brainstorming on how to respond to the reviews of the Catalyst program, and my, I was all excited, and my students go, it sounds like you have the Avengers of research on your team. So let me dive in and talk about these four areas. Mindset affects how we see the world. It influences attention, motivation, and physiology. So we all know about the placebo effect. If you take a blue pill, for example, and you expect this is gonna help you, in fact, there's a robust effect that engages your capacity for self-healing. Ali Crum's work, one of our team members, provides a wonderful example of this. Ali studied how mindset affects physiology of hotel workers. So she informed a group of hotel workers that, that the study wasn't designed to improve their, their wellness in the workplace. Half of them were also informed that physical activity didn't need to be burdensome. And in fact, they were already meeting the US Surgeon General's guidelines for physical activity. Simply by informing them, they lost weight and their blood pressure dropped. Those that were not informed did not have a change. These are two of the several positive health outcome measures just by simply informing them of this information. So we've begun to work with Ali and uh, harness the power of this in promoting healthy behaviors. Abby King, also one of our team members, introduced Carmen into a community center that served uh, older Hispanic uh, adults with the goal of increasing physical activity. So Carmen was a uh, appearing low tech virtual advisor. Individuals would come into the community center, meet with Carmen on the average of seven minutes, say hello, get some data based on their pedometer they were wearing on their hip. They'd get personalized recommendations and some uh, subject specific educational materials. So here's what happened. Individuals who interacted with Carmen were physically active for 250 minutes, so four hours a week more than those that didn't. Four hours a week of additional activity because of what Abby knows about behavior change theory and her ability to implement it. So this change happened over the four months of the study and for the five months following the study. People were super disappointed when Carmen left their community center. They loved her, they were super engaged with her because it was well-validated theory and good storytelling. James Landay, one of our partners, has been following activity tracking and encouragement for over a decade. I love this old picture of the old phone. Uh, some key findings were that state-of-the-art activity detection alone is not enough, I think we know that. Simple stories are compelling, and participants that had this garden display in which their physical activity made the garden grow were physically more active than others. Yuri Leskovich will bring his superpowers to our project as well in data-driven personalization. Yuri developed the recommendation system for Facebook to help you find friends and the personalization system to help you click ads in Pinterest. These are powerful techniques to manipulate your behavior and he's been using this together to understand how people can, we can get people to move more. So in this experiment, Tim Altoff, who's a joint student between our labs, looked at how adding a friend to your social network increased your activity. And you see at time zero here, you get a nice bump in activity, about 400 steps per day. And that fades over time, but it fades over a pretty long time, about three months until you're back to where you were ahead of time. Some people changed a lot, some people didn't change at all. So being able to characterize the time dynamics of this and personalize interventions for things that work for you, where adding a friend is one example, is part of our approach. So these are powerful approaches to motivating mobility and physical activity. And we're super excited to do this because it's the potential to have an effect is fantastic. This is a worldwide problem that 
we can make progress on and we can distribute this technology in a very inexpensive way to millions of people. And it is very clear that this is inexpensive and potent medicine to improve medical and physical well-being. So what projects are we going to pursue? We'll use these in two major projects. The first is a narrative-based smartphone app to shape mindsets and motivate activity. So we've already begun to work. Ali's working with James. Paula Moya has joined the team. Uh, she's an expert from the English department in narrative to create compelling, personalized stories that engage you, where your physical activity is part of the story and how your character evolves. Our goal is to motivate small bouts of activity because we've found that they can particularly, be particularly easier to motivate and potent medicine. We'll be able to measure and shape mindsets. And then Yure and I will be responsible for, in the third year of the project, project deploying this on a large scale with industry partners. Is it, know how to do this and software to do this can be deployed on a very broad scale and quite inexpensively. The second project is a personalized activity intervention to reduce pain in individuals with osteoarthritis. We care about this because half of Americans over 65 have arthritis. It begins to appear around the mid-50s and incidence increases with age. It's incredibly painful and reduces your mobility. In my lab, we've done a small intervention on a small cohort of subjects, but we found that the right dose of the right kind of exercise can reduce pain increase physical activity, and improve cartilage health. So these people are super engaged. They come into our lab, and we can reduce their pain and increase their function. They love us. There's 45 of them. What we'd like to be able to do is through state-of-the-art motion sensing, personalization of models, to develop an app where we can increase activity, decrease pain, and increase function. So to be clear, osteoarthritis really hurts. It's incredibly painful, and it limits your activity in a big way. We have an innovation that can increase activity and reduce pain. 56 million people in the US have osteoarthritis. If we can make a dent in this, that will be a great effect. We're also going to pursue three pilot projects. The first is increasing activity via a living chair. We can't do everything through the smartphone. We spend lots of time in our seats, on our butts, Pablo's developed this really interesting living chair that can manipulate you, and we're going to do experiments to see how that affects your attention, ability of work, and your activity. Yuri and I will also develop collaborations with game companies. Pokemon Go created a stampede of activity. I don't know if you've seen any of these videos, but there are thousands of people running through Central Park to find a rare Pokemon. It's definitely possible to manipulate people's physical behavior. There are millions of people who are engaged in games, none of which include physical activity as part of their scenarios. So we'd like to embed physical activity so that you evolve through the scenarios by being more physically active. Our third pilot project will build on the beautiful work Jesse Dunn and Mike Snyder are doing in our genetics and medical school department where they're looking at individuals with prediabetes and looking how we can shape mindsets to increase physical activity. Diabetes is essentially preventable. Type 2 diabetes is preventable with physical activity interventions. So to be able to prevent this very expensive chronic disease with a relatively low cost intervention is one of our goals, and we'll explore that in the pilot project. So we expect to have important impact by gaining fundamental insights into motivating mobility. Most of the work in activity trackers is happening in industry. It's all top secret. We are driven to gain basic insights, make discoveries, publish those, make them available via webcasts. We will also cross-train a new set of scholars. This is going to take more than three years and $3 million to solve. There is almost no one cross-trained in activity tracking, human-computer interaction, mindset, disease progression. And there's a set of postdocs that want to work with us, and we're beginning to train each other cross-disciplinary, so we're going to train the next generation as part of our project. We'll also produce data, models, and software, and distribute that as an open source project. I took this map from our project website uh, yesterday. One of the tools we're developing for biomechanical studies is available open source. 21,000 people or researchers are using it. 
to uh, improve the capabilities in their lab and will continue to promote that open source effort. The overall goal is to have a new paradigm for health and behavior change deployed at a planetary scale and build on campus a lasting collaboration between humanists, scientists, and engineers. We really like each other. We're enjoying learning from each other. We actually need each other to be successful in the project. This is not a project that can be broken up and achieved in little chunks. It has to be a team project. And we're motivated to do that because we can really have a global impact. It's incredibly motivating to have the door open to be able to reduce depression, anxiety, dementia, diabetes in millions of people worldwide at low cost. And that's what's driving us. I want to invite the team up and uh, open it up to questions. So thank you. I, I really like the problem. Uh, it seems uh, uh, quite important. I wanted to ask a question about the messaging with respect to um, the change that you anticipate. How much of that messaging is undetermined and needs further research versus quite simple, especially the messaging you'd want to do at scale, quite simple, known now, and you could attack right now? I'll give a quick answer and turn it over to Ali. Uh, the, the, the messaging is not the same for everybody. It needs to be personalized. And the way to do that is to give people messages and discover what works for them and then uh, individualize based on that. Re regarding mindset, the messaging is a little bit more consistent, and I'll turn it to Ali. Yeah, so there's been decades of research on motivation, which we can pull from, but the more recent research on mindset uh, we think is a major uh, missing piece in all of this. So there are two mindsets that our work has shown really matter. The first is adequacy mindset. So do you feel like you are getting enough exercise? And that we've shown in several studies can lead not only to increased motivation, but also improved benefits from the exercise you're actually doing. Uh, the second mindset that we know matters substantially are mindsets around the process of engaging in physical activity. So most people believe that exercise is hard, painful, depriving, and isolating, and we know uh, if we can shift people to view exercising as fun, indulgent, social, uh, that that will be significantly more motivating for them. So we have a, a good body of research that support those mindsets as being impactful, and we intend to leverage that with the narrative approach and other approaches. And there's been virtually no work done around that on a large scale. I've heard it said that uh, you can't exercise away a bad diet. Uh, to what extent are you working on nutritional aspects as well and, and what role that plays in, in health overall? Our project's really focused on, I agree with you 100%, that's the other side of the equation, energy in and energy out, especially related to obesity, which is one of the things that we're addressing. Uh, we don't have plans here to uh, in, in the Catalyst proposal to specifically look at that. But Abby King, for example, one of our team members is working with the Google Food Group to understand how the energy in part of the equation is taken into account because obviously for weight management, it's uh, crucial. And the, the beauty of the mindset approach is it tends to bleed out into other domains. So if you allow people to feel like they are getting enough exercise, that exercise is something they enjoy, uh, they gradually start to view being healthy in general as something that they identify with. Uh, so we think that these things not only could be, you know, replaced and, and sort of tailored to the food domain, but will also have an impact on healthy eating. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, um, in our pilot, so first of all, we actually do surveys, food surveys, so we track at a global level, and a subset of our individuals actually wear continuous glucose monitors, so, and they do keep food logs as part of that. So, uh, for at least a smallish group, we will track that. I had a question. Um, I see some of my favorite data and human-computer interaction people up there, and I get your role. I also see Jen on Bao. And I wondered if there's going to be a f sort of physical body uh, biosensing portion to this project, and that's what Jenan is up there. Yeah, I'll start and turn it to Jenan. Um, 
the, the intervention for osteoarthritis is all done in the laboratory. There's no mobile sensing capability. Uh, it's not possible to scale that by having people come into the lab. So we need wearable electronic sensors to characterize the level of physical activity of individuals. We can do that with big clunky sensors, but Genin's uh, wearable stretchable sensors are way better. Yes, that's uh, exactly the role I plan to play in this project, to design um, thin and conformal sensors that are comfortable for the users to wear. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're going to have to stop the questioning at this point, so let's thank this team again. <laughs>